Wonderful. And is my intro slide coming up clean this time? I know we had some technical issues last time. Okay, Oops. great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks good. And good evening, Nikki. How are you? Hey, Olivia. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Okay, welcome everybody. We will be getting started shortly. Hey, Jen, if you don't mind, um, just before I start my presentation, I, I, I just want to mention, you know, one of our real EJ leaders passed away about 10 oh. days ago. So, uh, I'm so sorry Cameron. to hear that. Yeah, and he was, he was fairly close to us in New Jersey. So I just wanna, wanna mention that in his memory. Absolutely. People are entering the virtual door right now. So we are, we are live. Anybody else hearing that weird noise in the background? Don't tell me you can hear my dishwasher all the way in the other room. Oh, I think that's what it is. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, can you hear it while I'm speaking? No. Okay, well, I will go on mute when others present. Otherwise, it's gonna be a whole kerfuffle at this point. <laughs> this, this, these cheapy little earbuds are-, are... They're very good. <laughs> because the dishwasher is not that loud. Okay, so people are still coming in. It looks like we, um, hopefully we'll have a busy session this evening. <clears throat> Okay, welcome everybody to the 47th Annual Environmental Congress and our very first ever first virtual Congress. Uh, thank you for being with us. I know many people who are here this evening have been with us all month long. We're bringing you programming on Thursday evenings and Friday afternoons throughout the month of October. And we are tweeting from our account at Anjack Tweets and using the hashtag EnviroCongress to share information about um, each of our sessions. So please feel free. Um, we encourage you to join in the conversation uh, using that hashtag EnviroCongress. My name is Jennifer Coffey. I'm the Executive Director of Anjack, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. I will apologize for the background noise. As was pointed out to me a minute ago, I've got the dishwasher going, but now I've got a cat who has seen fit to um, rip up some serious amount of brown paper that Amazon was kind enough to deliver to me. So <laughs> sorry for the background noise. A Little bit of housekeeping. If you've been with us all month long, you've heard this um, time and time again. So just bear with me, please. Uh, please type your questions into the Q&A section of Zoom. If you use your cursor and scroll down the bottom of your screen, you'll see a pop-up menu and you have a Q&A option. Please do not use the chat. That will not be monitored as well. Just use the Q&A section. We have several ANJAC staff members here with us this evening. They will be monitoring the chat. And at the end, after our speakers have completed um, their presentations, um, we will ask Q&A towards the end of this evening's program. 
Also, if you have any technical difficulties with Zoom, you can go ahead and type in the Q&A section and we can try to troubleshoot with you and um, help you out, whether you're having sound or video issues or, or doing the screen problems. If you're really having trouble with your presentation or with your viewing the presentations and you just can't seem to figure it out, the chat's not working or the q and is not working for you, you can go ahead and call our deputy director, Elizabeth Ritter. That's her cell phone number there and she can troubleshoot the IT with you. I also want to remind everybody that all of our sessions uh, throughout the month of October for Environmental Congress are being recorded, and we will post a link to those recordings at a later date at Anjak's YouTube channel. And we have been sending out those links and we'll continue to send those links out uh, to Congress registrants um, after Congress is completed. I want to thank our many and generous sponsors who have made not only this Environmental Congress, but our 46 previous Environmental Congresses possible. Without their support, we would not be able to continue to bring programming like this to you. And so we really appreciate working with them and them standing by us and standing by you to bring you information throughout the month of October. We also wanna thank our generous foundation supporters as well as our nonprofit partners who stand with us in education and protection and restoration of New Jersey's natural resources. Finally, this is us. You've probably seen this picture before if you've been with us throughout the month. So we're coming to you from our homes, our dining rooms, our living rooms, our, our kitchens with our, our fuzzies, our cats, our dogs, our laptops. Uh, we have a very limited capacity in the office these days, but we are fully functional and here to serve you and your communities. Uh, the best way to email us or, or to contact us is at uh, our email info at anjack.org. That's info at anjack.org. But you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, and um, you know how to get in touch with us because you, you have been. We are thrilled, I just want to add a, a notion, to continue to work with environmental commissioners throughout the state of New Jersey. We have uh, registrants from all 21 counties in the state coming to Environmental Congress this year, as you have in the past. So we're, we're really grateful for your continued engagement with us and also with your communities. So we have had more than 1,000 environmental commissioners engaged so far in 2020 this year, and the lion's share of that has been virtually, because ANJAC, like many other organizations, ceased doing in-person public programming in early March of this year. So we will continue to bring you virtual programming uh, throughout at least the first half of 2021, but likely throughout the entire year of next year. And so we, we encourage you to continue to engage with us, follow us on social media to find out about our upcoming programs. So before I turn over tonight's program to our esteemed presenters, I wanted to take a moment to say one word, and that word is plastics because I can't stop talking about plastics because it is such a phenomenally uh, important issue, not only for our wildlife, for our clean water, for the water we drink, the air we breathe, uh, but for stemming the impacts of climate change. Uh, many of you know that single use plastics are primarily made from the waste products of fracking. And so to continue to support single use plastics means to continue to support fracking. And so where we can cut off the supply and demand chain for one of them, we can have a great effect on the other. And it is because of you and because of the environmental commissioners throughout the entire state of New Jersey that you have now passed 130 local ordinances. When I had the great pleasure of standing in front of you at Mercer County Community College two years ago at our 2018 Environmental Congress, we had two two ordinances on plastics in the entire state. Since then, you went to work, you went to educating, you went to advocating to your communities, to your local officials, and passed 130 local ordinances. This, your action, is what convinced the New Jersey Senate and the New Jersey legislature to move forward and adopt the strongest Plastic Pollution Prevention Act 
in the country. Unfortunately, it is still an act. It is not yet a law. And so we would encourage you. I know many of you have continued to call. Many of you have asked me, do I have to keep still calling? Hasn't he signed that yet? No, it is not yet signed into law. So Governor Murphy at 609-292-6000. He has until by our math, um, Monday, November 9th, to take action on um, this legislation that is sitting on his desk. So the clock is ticking very quickly. Uh, and uh, I have heard, because I read the papers, that Governor Murphy is in support of this legislation. When we spoke with his senior policy advisors, they were quick to point out his support in the press, uh, but also told us that the polystyrene industry is lobbying the governor's office very, very hard. Um, they do not like this law and uh, they would like him to not sign it or at least um, conditionally veto it. So that makes me nervous. Um, I, am, I am hopeful that Governor Murphy will, will sign this legislation and will stick to what he has said in the press in terms of supporting it, but it is not signed yet. So please, yes, keep calling. Call him, tweet at him, keep it up. Um, when we know something about the, the bill being signed into law, you will know something. But right now, we do not know anything yet. With that said, um, I want to encourage you, if you have not yet voted, to please vote. Every registered voter in New Jersey has received a ballot in the mail. At this point in time, it's getting a little bit late to mail by USPS, um, US Postal Service. Uh, New Jersey does have a grace period so long as your ballot is um, postmarked by election day. However, those county ballot boxes are a very safe way to vote as well. So please fill out your ballot, take it to your nearest county ballot box. If you need information about where those ballot boxes are located, you can find that information at nj.gov backslash state backslash elections. You can also go to the League of Women Voters. We are proud to have partnered with them this year uh, to assist in voter education. One more note, we appreciate and we want to thank you for all of your donations. You have continued to support ANJAC for our 51 years of history. You make it possible for us to work to support the more than 380 environmental commissions in the state of New Jersey and to work with all 565 municipalities in 21 counties, whether they have an environmental commission or they're working to start one or they are, are dedicated citizens um, who would like to inspire their governing body to consider adopting uh, an EC. Your donations keep us going. They help us to do our work in Trenton as well. Uh, this year we worked uh, very very intensively on that plastics legislation. And next year we will continue to work on additional plastics legislation uh, as well as uh, some climate change legislation that's pending. So we thank you, we appreciate you and we do our very best to steward your dollars. So with that, I'm very pleased uh, to uh, welcome you to our second to the last session of um, our month long environmental Congress. We are um, very lucky this evening to have both DEP Deputy Commissioner Olivia Glenn with us, as well as Dr. Nikki Sheets, uh, who is a board member for the Environmental Justice Alliance and a professor at uh, Thomas Edison. And so I, there are no two better people who we could ask to grace us tonight to, to speak about uh, cumulative impacts, environmental justice, how we can continue to support the, um, the long, long fight that they have been working to ensure that we have more um, fair and just environmental regulations and policies for communities who have long, long been overburdened with more pollution than many other communities. With that said, I would also like to invite you to join us tomorrow for our last session of our 2020 Environmental Congress. This is a networking session because what's, what's Congress without a little bit of networking? We wanna encourage you to share the work that you're doing on the local level, connect with others who are fighting the same good fight and struggling with the same struggles. So that'll be tomorrow at noon.
And we'd also like to invite you to join our program on Friday, November 13th. This is a fundraiser in support of Anjac's work, and we will be bringing you presentations from partner businesses, vineyard, a distillery, and a brewery. Um, these businesses, uh, we've partnered with these businesses because not only do they have Jersey products that use Jersey water, but they are good uh, environmental and community stewards, and we'll hear about their water conservation practices, their stormwater management practices, and their community partnership efforts. So we hope that you can join us there and learn about some New Jersey products that you may want to consider stocking up on because the holidays are right around the corner, believe it or not. With that, I want to thank you for being here this evening. Uh, there are, that's our website. You can join us in our conversation at Anjack Tweets. And again, we're using the hashtag at Enviro Congress. And if you have general questions about Anjack, go ahead and um, email us at info at .org. And with that, I would like to welcome our first speaker for this evening. Dr. Nikki Sheets. And Nikki, I would like to invite you to go ahead and share your screen and get your presentation up. Uh, Dr. Nikki Sheets is uh, an attorney and the director of the Center of Urban Environment of the John S. Watson Institute for Public Policy at Thomas Edison State University and has defined the primary mission of the center as providing support for the environmental justice community. Among the issues he works on are air pollution, climate change, cumulative impacts, developing EJ legal strategies, and increasing the working capacity of the EJ community. Cheats was a founding member of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance and the EJ Leadership Forum. He served on the New Jersey Clean Air Council and EPA's Clean Air Act Advisory Committee and the National EJ Advisory Committee. Sheets was also the co-author of the Human Health Chapter of the 2014 National Climate Assessment. Early in his career, he practiced law as public interest attorney. During that time, Sheets served as local clerk for Chief Justice of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, as a landlord tenant housing attorney at the Camden Regional Legal Services, and as a public defender in New Brunswick and as a legal instructor at a community legal education and college preparatory program in Harlem. He holds a BA from Princeton University and earned PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences, JD and MPP from Harvard University. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Nikki Sheets to be with us here this evening. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks, Jen. And uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, absolutely, we can hear you. Thanks for the invitation. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. I actually want to start off by, um, before I start my presentation, by uh, just paying a tribute to an environmental justice colleague named uh, Cecil Corbin Mark, who was deputy director um, at REACT for Environmental Justice in, in West Harlem, who passed away the week before last. He was uh, a giant EJ movement, both nationally and on the local level in New York. and. We were close to him here in New Jersey, and um, his loss is, is we're, we're fairly stunned about it, to tell you the truth. And so his loss is sorely felt, but we're going we're gonna to keep on in, in his name. Um, so as Jen said, I am here representing two organizations, um, my center at, at the Watson Institute at Thomas Edison State University. I'm going to turn my timer on, talk for about 20 minutes here. Um, representing my center at, at, at the Watson Institute at Thomas Edison State University and the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. And I wanna talk about uh, cumulative impacts and recent legislation and uh, other strategies to address cumulative impacts. Uh, it's a huge EJ issue. There is your formal definition of cumulative impacts. They are the risk and impacts caused by multiple pollutants um, and, and caused by pollutants, these pollutants both individually and when they interact with each other and with any social vulnerabilities that may exist in communities. And these multiple pollutants are usually emitted by multiple sources of, 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 of pollution in a neighborhood. And it's a longstanding environmental justice problem and a recalcitrant uh, environmental justice problem has been hard to address for a number of reasons. Two of them I wanna highlight here. Uh, uh, one is that in this country, um, 
we attempt to regulate pollution by setting the individual standard for each pollutant. So we go pollutant by pollutant and set standards. Um, and and the, the kind of classic environmental justice problem is that um, the state and facility in you know, private industry wants to put a polluting facility in an environmental justice neighborhood. And we'll talk about what that is in, in, in a minute. And the community comes and says, well, you know, we already have a number of polluting facilities in the neighborhood. Why are you gonna put one more in our neighborhood? We don't want it. And, but typically uh, a lot of times the state will come back and say, and or EPA will come back and say, well, look, uh, the modeling has been done usually by the facility, by the way, and we don't see any uh, violation of, of an individual standard. And the problem with that is that, um, is that there can be detrimental health impacts even if no individual standard is violated uh, because you know, there's no standard for the cumulative amount of pollution, the total amount of pollution in a, in a neighborhood. And as I always say, when you breathe in air, it's not like you have partitions in your lungs where the you know, particulate matter goes to this part of your lungs and the, nox, the nitrogen dioxide goes to this part and sulfur dioxide goes to a different part. It all goes into your lungs and mixes in together, but there's nothing, usually there's nothing that takes account for that mixture of pollution across pollutants. And so a lot of times the community goes away, goes away frustrated. So that's one issue. The other issue is represented by this graph, these figures that actually New Jersey DEP produced in 2009. Um, and uh, they show you a relationship between cumulative impacts, pollution and race in New Jersey. And as I've kind of hinted informally, you can think of cumulative impacts as the total amount of pollution in the neighborhood or here an estimate of the total amount of pollution in the neighborhood. And so what DEP first did um, is that it, it estimated or came up with a measurement and a score for the uh, amount of cumulative impacts in every neighborhood in New Jersey. And then it said, well, um, what's the relationship between race, income, and cumulative impacts in New Jersey? So it graphed it. And it came up with what I often, well, what I always call uh, this, uh, these figures that show a very disturbing relationship and, um, and oftentimes I'll say an unholy relationship between race, income, and pollution in neighborhoods. Look at the top figure. As you see, as the number of people of color that live in New Jersey neighborhoods increases, so the amount of cumulative impacts or the estimate of total pollution. And the same thing is true for people living in poverty. As the number of people living in poverty in New Jersey neighborhoods increases, so does the amount of cumulative impacts. And, and, and that's why this is so troubling because this kind of relationship goes against every you know, standard of justice, everything that we at least claim we stand for in the state and, and the country. And um, I, I like these figures for several reasons. One is because even though you know, you know, there's no labels of neighborhoods on these figures, you can see the environmental justice neighborhoods, the communities of color and low income neighborhoods in New Jersey, they have a disproportionate amount of cumulative impacts. I mean, look at these figures. It's almost a perfect straight line relationship as the number of people of color, poor people living in the neighborhood increases, you know, so, that, so is the estimated amount of, of pollution. And I think that cries out um, for strategies to, to reduce uh, the disproportionate amount of pollution in these neighborhoods. And of course, what we're worried about is that the elevated disease rates that you, um, you almost always find in communities of color in low-income neighborhoods um, uh, across in, in, in for communities of color across um, income stratus, by the way, um, that this that there's a, a, also a correlation between these elevated disease rates and the elevated levels of pollution. So, in response to that, um, the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance and um, allies, uh, over the years, we've developed uh, solutions policy solutions to address cumulative impacts. Oh, you know, one thing, let me say this one thing um, before I leave this figure. This is not unique to New Jersey. Um, one of the things that started the environmental justice movement in the late 1980s was the fact there were several national studies that show similar relationships. And, uh, you know, many people troubled about this and that's 
one of the primary things that started the EJ movement. And there is a grassroots EJ movement of which New Jersey EJ Alliance is, is a member and a fairly prominent member. Um, so um, the New Jersey EJ Alliance, we developed several policy recommendations to address cumulative impacts. One was the EJ and cumulative impacts municipal ordinance that was adopted by Newark in 2016 that I won't talk about tonight other than to name. And another one is a um, statewide um, cumulative impacts uh, uh, policy, which I'll kind of talk about um, uh, um, tangentially. And you can ask me more about both of those in the question and answer period. Um, and, and here is a history from an advocacy, from an EJ point of view, uh, really of, of what's happened around cumulative impacts in New Jersey. And you see it goes back, goes back quite a ways. When New Jersey EJ Alliance jumped in was sometime in 2007, 2008, I still remember a meeting where we said, you know, if something's gonna be done about cumulative impacts, we think we need to do it. And we formed a committee that was composed of NJEJA members, uh, Inbound Community Corporation members, Clean Water Action members, and the Eastern Environmental Law Center and others. I know those four organizations were in and I can picture other, other individuals, but don't know who they were representing or if they were there as individuals. And we started to work on cumulative impacts. And at the time, the New Jersey EJ Advisory Council to DEP, New Jersey DEP, was composed, half of it was composed of NJEJA members, New Jersey EJ Alliance members. And remember, we're composed of people coming from other organizations, both other organizations and individuals. And um, for example, the chair of that committee at the time was Valerie Caffey, the vice chair, I think was Kim, Kim Gaddy, um, Ana Baptista was, you know, the treasurer, all of them, all of them NJEJA members, and we had other members from NJEJA on the council. And we thought a good way of, of uh, elevating the issue was to have the advisory council have a hearing on it and issue a report. And so we did that. Um, and the report was issued, Ana Baptista was the main author of that report with many of us acting um, as, as advisors, um, including uh, um, Dr. Peter Montague, who I'll, I'll call, call him out, Peter and I serve as, as advisors. Um, and I think it did elevate the issue. And um, I think it was one of the reasons that NJDEP developed the cumulative impact screening tool that developed the figures that I showed you. And for a reason I cannot remember, that committee went away, but we were determined to keep uh, keep you know advocating on cumulative impacts. So we formed another cumulative impacts committee, and that was just NJEJA members. But of course, again, we you know came from different organizations, and that was a committee that actually came up with both the municipal ordinance and the statewide um, cumulative impacts policy. And at some point, and I can't really you know we. we I have New Jersey statewide cumulative impacts bill. That was the first iteration of the bill that was adopted recently. I have this 2012, someone told me it was earlier, but we're gonna have to go back and really pin it down. I am in the process of, of writing a paper of, about uh, cumulative impacts that, um, that I've been in the process of writing ever since 2011, when we released <laughs> our statewide cumulative impacts policy, but it's especially needed now, um, especially on a, on, on, a, on a national level. So I'm gonna, you know, um, devote uh, uh, um, to, to writing that and we'll put some history in that too. And I will nail down when that first bill came and we supported the bill. The bill didn't come from the EJ community. We think it was probably provoked by the EJ community, came from Senator Weinberg and we supported it, but it didn't go anywhere. The next important thing that happened on cumulative impacts was really on the national level where Senator Booker wanted to uh, put together a national EJ bill and came to NJEJA and ICC. And we said, well, if you're gonna have a national EJ bill, you gotta put cumulative impacts in there. And we sent over our NJEJA statewide cumulative impacts policy to them. And um, they showed it to legislative council and it came back in a slightly altered version um, uh, in, in the national bill. But we think that also provoked bringing back up the statewide EJ bill um, um, by Senator Singleton, who was a hero to us, by the way. And we have talked to him more about what provoked, provoked that, but we, we, we think that was in large part due to that. And that was in um, 2018 sometime. And, um, you know, we started working on the, on the new bill ever since then. Um, by the way, 
there's another EJ, EJ for All Act bill in Congress in 2019. The uh, bill from Senator Booker's office, NJGA worked very hard to gain national EJ import, input into that bill. Um, we also served on advisory council to the bill from Senator Representatives Grahal and McKeachin's offices. And that bill has cumulative impact and just adopted it from the bill we worked on with Senator, um, Senator Booker. So since 2018, we, and in this case, the we is um, New Jersey EJ Alliance, ICC, Clean Water Action, worked together um, on, on the bill and, and, and you know, worked on the substance of it and, and advocated for it. And, and, and um, you know, I'm gonna end the history session there. One thing I will say, uh, I, I wanna mention is that we work, the three organizations work very well together, you know, two EJ organizations and an environmental organization, as you, you can see, um, you know, you know, NJJA, ICC, been the EJA organizations, Clean Water Action, environmental organization. We have a long history of working well together, and we worked well together. But I do want to mention that we did ask other environmental organizations to take a step back um, on this bill, so so EJ orgs and their close allies could lead. And um, this is a, a, a whole topic I could come back and talk on. Well, one reason we did that is because recently we've had good success in making EJ an important topic, a sexy topic. Recently, I mean like last five years maybe. And other organizations have come into the EJ space and that's good. That's what we want as EJ organizations. But it's also been a threat to us because other organizations have more name recognition, more resources in both money and people power. And frankly, you know, the EJ movement is mostly folks of color, environmental movement, mostly white folks. And it's still true in this country, despite Black Lives Matter, that you know usually what white folks say, especially on environmental and technical issues, carries more weight than what people of color say. So in any case, for all those reasons, we worry that we'll be moved out of our own space, out of the EJ space, which will have policy and just a whole lot of um, consequences if you move to organizations that have a history of working with EJ movement and come from the EJ or um, communities, move them out of that space. And we have to say the environmental organizations really respected that and we're really grateful and appreciative to them of that. And it will help us form relationships in the future with them to work together in a, together in a very principled way. Um, so let's look at the cumulative impacts bill that was passed, passed recently. I'm doing pretty good with time. Um, that was passed recently um, that, that is kind of a, well, you can ask more about our statewide policy. There's a little bit of a variation from this. And uh, here's the guts of the bill. First, the, the bill defines overburdened communities. Um, and it says that any community in New Jersey that's either 40% of color or, and it's very important that it's or, or 35% low income, or whose residents, 40% uh, at least 40% of the re residents are of limited English proficiency. Those are considered overburdened communities. Now, 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 now let's note this. Even though the bill said defines them as overburdened communities, they're really what, what the EJ community, av advocacy community, has called environmental justice communities. And you saw from our graph, from the graph I showed you, I think I said this, when I referred to the communities on the right of the figures as EJ communities, those are communities of color and low income communities. Um, and they're not really overburdened communities because there's, there's really no um, pollution burden criteria in here. So even though it says overburden, they're really EJ communities. Um, so it says that if you're seeking a major pollution permit in one of these communities, then you have to do an EJ analysis. And if that EJ analysis shows that the facility that wants to permit, if it um, was granted that permit and became operational in that community, if it would uh, cause an elevated level of cumulative environmental or public health stressors when compared to other block groups in the state, then if the request is for a new permit, it shall be denied. If it's the request is for a permit that is a permit renewal or permit for an, an, an expansion of a facility, then the state can put conditions on the permit to address the fact that it's gonna cause elevated levels of um, public health or environmental stressors. And keep in mind, that's when you take also take into account the existing level 
of cumulative environmental or public health standards. But it's very important to note that um, exactly how you do that analysis is going to be decided in rulemaking, which we are about to enter into. Um, Olivia um, and her colleagues at New Jersey DEP just had a, a good public session, opening public session a few days ago. And the EJ community will certainly be, um, will certainly be um, 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 participating in that process every, every step of the ways, even though it will be uh, a, definitely a resource burden for us. Um, here I say um, the term in elevated levels of cumulative environmental public health stressors. Um, you know, you, you're going to examine, examine the levels of those stressors existing and what will be added to it in EJ communities and compare it to other communities in the state, see if it's elevated. And again, how we actually do that will be decided in the regulations. So the regulatory process is going to be just as important as um, anything we've done um, done so far uh, with the with the legislation. So one thing I want to um, one thing I want to emphasize is that um, uh, it, I kind of said this before. In many ways, addressing cumulative impacts uh, has been the holy grail of the EJ movement. Right, it's been so um, important to us, and um, uh, we are very happy to have a cumulative impact, have cumulative impacts legislation that's going to directly address the issue of cumulative impacts. But uh, we don't want to give the impression that this is going to be um, a silver bullet. You know, this one policy is not going to be able to address all cumulative impact issues in the state or the total amount of disproportionate pollution in these environmental justice um, communities. So it, we're gonna need multiple strategies to address uh, cumulative impacts fully. And we've come to say that we're going to need um, cumulative policies to address cumulative impacts. And uh, some of these policies will address cumulative impacts directly, such as the new cumulative impacts legislation, but other of these policies will address pieces of the pollution that um, goes into forming part of that um, uh, elevated pollution bur burden in environmental justice communities. And we think one important type of policy that needs to be used to address cumulative impacts is climate change mitigation policy. And we say that for several reasons. One is because there is a political will um, outside of the current federal administration anyway, to address climate change policy. And we think, we think that political will will continue in some form, no matter what happens next week, and certainly on the state level. And um, you know, climate change mitigation policy, as probably all of you know, is all about reducing emissions, emissions of greenhouse gases, um, classically. And, and we think this presents a great opportunity though, to address the disproportionate pollution in EJ communities. You know, as we're, and what we're advocating is that as we are fighting climate change and EJ community is down with that, this climate change is gonna, well, because it's gonna hurt everybody, but because it's also gonna hurt our communities um, quicker, first and worse, right? Usually what we say. But what we're saying is that while we're fighting climate change, Let's make sure we're using mitigation policies that also address what we call greenhouse gas co-pollutants. Um, 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 uh, you know, air pollutants um, that are not greenhouse gases, but that are emitted simultaneously with those greenhouse gases, like uh, airborne particulate matter, NOx, uh, sulfur dioxide, because those co-pollutants have a detrimental local impact and form part of the disproportionate amount of pollution um, that um, you know is affecting detrimentally impacting EJ communities, and we call it power plants um, emit you know not only carbon dioxide but these other pollutants. So for us, you we we, we want to make sure we use climate change mitigation policy to both fight climate change and lower these pollutants, right, to levels they haven't been haven't been lowered to before, and if a policy does not do that, if climate change policy doesn't help fight these local pollutants, 
something we don't like it and we don't think it should be used. And uh, so we have two policies they think were very important in the state um, uh, that we're talking about. One is, is REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And we have big problems with REGI because REGI is a carbon trading system, market me mechanism that does not guarantee emissions reductions in EJ communities. You might or might not get them. And we want a climate change policy that guarantees emissions reductions in EJ communities. And we have developed a policy that can fit within REGI. We tried to stop the state from going into REGI, but we failed. Um, we have uh, developed a policy within REGI called mandatory emissions reductions uh, that we think can fit into REGI, or we may go to the state and you know find uh, another way to apply it. But it basically says that if you're a power plant in an EJ community or near EJ community, and your emissions are um, uh, significant impact in that community, you got to reduce your emissions. So far, we've not heard back from the state about that policy, even though we submitted that to the state over a year and a half ago. So we are still going to be advocating for that policy. And, and this policy, again, used in conjunction with the cumulative impacts policy that was passed recently. And the other climate change mitigation policy that you are going to be hearing a lot about, if you have not already, is a policy aimed to reduce emissions from mobile sources. And it's called the Transportation and Climate Initiative. And REGI is in 10 Northeastern states. TCI, short for Transportation and Climate Initiative, is, is going to be in 12 if it's adopted by the states, Northeastern states, sometimes called REGI on Reels. And we are opposing that policy, the EJ community is, um, because at its core is a carbon trading system that again will not guarantee emissions reductions in EJ communities. So we are urging the state not to enter Reggie, but to develop policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from mobile sources that will also reduce these other co-polluted emissions and that will guarantee they'll be reduced in EJ communities. And so if you couple these two kinds of policies, the mandatory emissions reduction policies for power plants that will get reductions in EJ communities and mandatory emissions policy, policies um, for mobile sources in EJ communities, which you know will not be TCI, couple this with the, the cumulative impacts um, legislation, you'll have a good, not quite coherent, but a real good start on EJ policies in New Jersey that will begin to significantly address the um, disproportionate pollution in EJ communities and something we can all be proud of and something frankly that fits into um, the current worry in the United States by many people about social and racial justice. Um, and I start off by saying there are two reasons we wanna use climate change policy. One of the reasons is because we don't wanna pass up this opportunity to help EJ communities. Another is that climate change mitigation policy is going to be the most important environmental policy or is probably that we, you know, globally that we pass um, in the United States. And um, if you're unwilling to use climate change mitigation policy to address EJ issues, what does that say about how you feel about EJ issues and if they're a priority to you? Um, so here's, here's something, here's our statewide community impacts policy. Um, you can ask me about that later, but I'm gonna stop now. And I think I did it actually, I think I'm ahead of time. Oh, I'm right at 20 minutes. I still think I should get a prize, um, but I will stop and look forward to any questions that you might have. Jen, I'll give you the screen back. Wonderful, thank you, Nikki, that was fabulous. Really appreciate it. Um, we are going to hold questions until after Olivia speaks, but I wanna remind all of our attendees to please use the Q&A option for um, documenting your questions for our speakers. With that, I would like to introduce uh, our Deputy Commissioner, NJDEP Deputy Commissioner, uh, Olivia Glenn. She was appointed in July. Olivia is responsible for prioritizing the advancement of the administration's environmental justice and equity goals. A longtime advocate of ensuring underserved communities have access to the outdoors, Olivia believes every New Jerseyan has the right to experience and enjoy the benefits of nature. Olivia previously led the DEP's Division of Parks and Forestry, 
serving since 2018 as its director and managing 450,000 acres of natural and historic resources. From 2003 to 2009, she worked as the division's urban initiatives and outreach coordinator and subsequently served as special assistant to the DEP deputy commissioner. Olivia later was a member of DEP's Environmental Justice Advisory Council, leading its efforts in outreach, education, and land management. Olivia has also worked with the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, making outdoor spaces and trails more readily available to the greater Philadelphia residents, especially people living in Camden. In 2018, the Camden Collaborative Initiative honored her with its Camden Environmental Hero Award. As Deputy Commissioner, Olivia will chair CCI's steering committee and will be responsible for environmental justice, diversity, and environmental education. Olivia earned a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from Dartmouth College. She holds a master's from the Yale School of Environment where she wrote her master's thesis on park revitalization in Camden. In her free time, she enjoys the outdoors and singing and playing the flute, piano, and bassoon. Olivia is married and has three children. Olivia, it's so wonderful to have you here with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I understand um, that you are going to speak to us this evening without PowerPoint, because we're all, we all have Zoom and PowerPoint fatigues. <laughs> <laughs> I better be really engaging because- So we appreciate that. Slides. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could share with us an overview of um, what you're working on now, as well as the DEP's current initiatives on environmental justice related to the legislation Nikki just spoke about, as well as I know the DEP has additional initiatives um, that you and others are working on. So if you could just give us an overview of that, that would be wonderful. I would be delighted. Thank you so much. So good evening to everyone. I want to thank Anjek for inviting me to speak to you this evening. And it is also a pleasure for me to sit on a panel with Dr. Nikki Sheets, whose scholarship advocacy and service is deeply valuable for overburdened communities all around New Jersey. And finally, I am delighted to be here with each and every one of you who decided to spend your Thursday evening listening to a presentation on environmental justice. Um, and specifically, um, I'm delighted to be here with other environmental commissioners all around the state. Um, I am a former member of my township's environmental commission myself in Pensacola Township, and I know the importance of your civil service in that role. And so your role in that capacity is vitally important to ensuring that citizens' voices are integrated in local decision making. So thank you for your service. So as Jen has noted, I've spent a great deal of my personal and professional life working to ensure that every New Jerseyan has the right to enjoy the benefits of nature and a healthy environment. And now as Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Justice and Equity for the past three months and counting in DEP, I oversee the offices of environmental justice, diversity, inclusion, and outreach, equal employment opportunity and public contract assistance, and environmental education. And I also chair the steering committee of the Community Collaborative Initiative, which I'll speak about in a little while. So I'm proud to be leading the DEP's effort to aid overburdened communities throughout New Jersey and to bolster diversity, equity, and inclusion within our own department. So here is what I hope you take away from tonight's presentation. Environmental justice is, an, is a vital part of making New Jersey stronger and fairer for all of its residents. And I encourage every environmental commission in the state to join us in that mission by bringing the environmental justice message to your communities that you've heard tonight from both Nikki and you'll hear from myself. And keep vulnerable populations at the center of your decisions as local environmental commissioners. So why is environmental justice important? Since the civil rights movement of the 1960s, grassroots communities nationwide have documented disproportionate environmental burdens, such as higher rates of air and water pollution. These disparities are endured by poor communities and communities of color, not only in urban centers, but also in rural communities. And New Jersey is certainly no exception. From our industrialized urban centers to our rural migrant farming communities, these issues are present all across the Garden State. 
Stories from communities and academic research institutions have documented that a disproportionate number of minority and poor communities host potentially toxic facilities, such as landfills, incinerators, and other waste disposal entities. However, the disparities are not limited to air quality and facility siting. They are also present in climate change impacts, water, water infrastructure and flooding issues, and are reflected in land use and planning policies. Practices clearly embedded in racial injustice, such as redlining in housing and zoning, and the siting of highways, and the consequential bifurcation of communities in the 1950s and 1960s, created environmental conditions and limited mobility that contributed to disparate negative public health outcomes, such as elevated blood lead levels, asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and developmental problems in overburdened communities. Environmental injustices did not happen overnight. It's not through the course of one decision or one administration at any level of government. And it will take all of us working together to reset the course for the improvement of quality of life in all of our communities. We can no longer allow in our state overburdened communities to continue to be overburdened and underserved. When we protect our most vulnerable communities, we elevate the entire state. So under the leadership of Governor Murphy and Commissioner Catherine McCabe, we have truly made great strides in advancing environmental justice goals. Perhaps the most prominent of these came on September 18th, when New Jersey became the first state in the nation to pass an environmental justice law. This law aims to better protect lower income communities, communities of color, and limited English proficient communities from the cumulative impacts of pollution that Nikki spoke about so eloquently just before me. This new law requires the DEP to evaluate the environmental and public health impacts of certain facilities on overburdened communities when reviewing certain permit applications, such as major sources of air pollution, from gas-fired power plants and cogeneration facilities, resource recovery facilities or incinerators, sludge processing facilities, sewage treatment plants with a capacity of more than 50 million gallons per day, transfer stations or solid waste facilities, recycling facilities that receive at least 100 tons of recyclable material per day, scrap metal facilities, landfills, some medical waste and, and some medical waste incinerators. This law goes into effect immediately upon the adoption of rules and regulations. And at that time, the department shall not consider complete for review any application for a permit for a new facility or for the expansion of an existing facility or any application for the renewal of an existing facility's major source permit if the facility is located or proposed to be located in an overburdened community unless that applicant first prepares an environmental justice impact statement that assesses the potential environmental and public health stressors associated with that facility's application. And the stressors already borne by that community are also incorporated into that analysis as a result of those conditions that are already in that community. Following that, that applicant has to organize and conduct a public hearing within that community. At that public hearing, the permit applicant is required to provide clear and full information about the proposed new or expanded facility or existing major source as applicable and the potential stressors associated with that facility. Following that hearing, DEP will consider the testimony presented and any written comments received and evaluate the issuance of or, con or conditions to that particular permit as necessary in order to avoid or reduce the adverse stressors on the community. For a new facility, the department may deny a permit if it is determined to cause or contribute to adverse cumulative environmental or public health stressors in the overburdened community that are higher than those borne by other communities. For the expansion of an existing facility or the renewal of a facility's major source permit, the department may, after review of the environmental justice impact statement and any other relevant information, apply conditions to that permit concerning the construction and operation of that facility to protect public health. So right now, in order to advance that law, 
the rulemaking process must be completed. And as Nikki noted, uh, we just held our first meeting to that effect. It was a week ago today. So at that meeting, we were joined by over 150 attendees that ranged from individuals, environmental justice advocates, representatives of business and industry, all levels of government, environmental organizations, and social organizations, such as the NAACP. What we believe is that this bill represents the rectifying of the burden on marginalized communities and that responsible businesses can use this change as an opportunity to thrive and grow with their neighbors. It is imperative that we stand up for underserved communities, those that shoulder more than their fair share of pollution and environmental hazards, those whose residents suffer significantly higher incidence of asthma and other respiratory illnesses, and those that have limited access to open spaces and to nature. So some of the other actions that DEP has taken besides uh, the passage of this particular law has been uh, in his first 100 days, Governor Murphy signed Executive Order 23. And that executive order directed mm -hmm. all executive branch departments, agencies, boards, councils, and commissions to consider environmental justice in their statutory and regulatory authority. To do so, the executive order directed the DEP to create a guidance document and to launch an environmental justice interagency council. So I'm pleased to share with you that in my first three months in this role, actually at the beginning of this month, DEP issued that guidance document. Um, it's entitled Furthering the Promise, a guidance document for advancing environmental justice across state government. This document directs New Jersey's executive agencies to weave the principles of environmental justice into their core functions. And together as state agencies, we set an example for the rest of the state. We can help to center our environmental justice communities in decisions at all levels of government. And we will host our first environmental justice interagency council meeting next week. So we'll have representatives from every department and agency in state government as well as a few boards, councils, and commissions. Uh, that number is continuing to grow and we will continue to, to press for advancement um, with those particular entities within state government. The work of the council will produce two things. We'll produce initial assessments as well as action plans to help the departments and agencies complete initial assessments and advance action plans. We'll be providing trainings, workshops, and work groups that help them work uh, to identify ways that they can set milestones that decrease environmental and public health stressors, as well as to increase environmental and public health benefits in communities. So when I look at the work that the environmental justice law does, like Nikki said uh, during his presentation, this one law is not a panacea for all of the environmental injustices that happen in communities. And its focus is specifically on siting issues um, when, I'm, when we're looking at the work that we can do uh, through the Interagency Council, it's going to give us the opportunity to work more collaboratively across state government because we know that many of the impacts that happen in a local community don't fall into the silo of one department, agency, or a program. They're, they often cross over across departments. And so this uh, Interagency Council is really going to be a way where we can build synergy and reach some shared outcomes for the benefit of communities in a way that's really relevant for how communities are impacted. So in addition to that, um, I thought I would share a few other things that we've done in terms of environmental justice accomplishments. Um, our attorney general in partnership with us has taken legal action to protect our environmental justice communities. In this past August, we filed 12 new lawsuits involving polluters in nine environmental justice communities around the state. The state has filed several national natural resource damage lawsuits since 2018. Though many are ongoing, New Jersey has already obtained judgments totaling more than $14 million against polluters. There's also much work to be being done right now through our community collaborative initiative, which embeds DEP staff at the ground level in communities where multiple environmental stressors exist and supports their vision for revitalization and growth. These 12 DEP employees use their expertise and resources to help local leaders effectively address environmental concerns. And these 12 communities are Bayonne, Camden, Perth Amboy, and Trenton, 
They were our first four. And then in August of 2019, we expanded to eight more cities. It was Bridgeton, Jersey City, Millville, Newark, Patterson, Paulsboro, Salem City, and Vineland. And certainly, if anyone who's listening this evening is in one of those 12 municipalities, I'd be delighted to connect you with those respective CCI liaisons because you guys should be working hand in hand. So DEP is very grateful to its sister agency, the Economic Development Authority, for its efforts to help expand this initiative. So this initiative has done vital work all around the state. In Camden, the CCI staff has collaborated with local leaders and DEP experts to jumpstart the transformation of an 86 acre landfill. Uh, the first 24 acres of that landfill uh, was transformed into the Ray and Joan Crock Salvation Army Center and that property opened in 2014. On the balance of that landfill, the remaining 62 acres, our Office of Natural Resource Restoration is closing that portion of the landfill and transforming that into a park. That park is expected to open in fall of 2021. And at that time, that park will be the largest park in the city of Camden. In Perth Amboy, embedded staff facilitated the launch of a project to clean up a six acre scrap heap and build a new park on that site. In Trenton, the CCI staff have helped to advance the development of the Aston Pink Greenway Park, a 99 acre redevelopment project that will include soccer fields, a waterfront walkway and other amenities. There are many more examples of this work all around the state. Just again, in closing, I want to underscore that the work of environmental justice cannot be the responsibility of any one government agency, group, or entity. None of us can do this work alone. From the EJ bill signing to greener spaces in Perth, Perth Amboy and Camden and other achievements across the Garden State, we have seen what success looks like, but there's still much more work to be done. And I look forward to working with each of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olivia. I really appreciate that comprehensive overview of um, where we're going with the environmental justice rules, as well as the other initiatives that DEP is working on. We do have a few questions and um, a little bit of time. Uh, and so, Dr. Sheets, I would encourage you if you could come. I think you're off mute. And there you go. Now we can see you. Wonderful. Um, so I'll go through the questions in the order in which they were asked. Um, as many things um, these days come to, there's a, there's a question about COVID and COVID deaths have now been shown to be most deadly when compounded with air pollution. Is this related also to communities of color and poverty? I don't know if either of you have um, thoughts on that or, or expertise on that particular question. Do you want to go first, Olivia? You want to? After you, Dr. Sheets. <laughs> <laughs> We're always as polite to each other. <laughs> right? Olivia's laughing at that one. <laughs> um, well, yeah, unfortunately, COVID pointed out what EJ advocates have been saying for a long time. I mean, we've been saying the cumulative impacts um, is, you know, it's not only killing and make people, making people ill in disproportionate numbers in communities of color and low-income communities, EJ communities, but that is also making these communities more vulnerable to um, uh, environmental and public health issues that, that uh, you know, that are, that are coming in the future that come along. And COVID has, uh, has shown that. Think of the definition of cumulative impacts I put up. Um, multiple pollutants and their interaction, you know, problems they cause individually, but by their interactions with each other and with social vulnerabilities. And those social vulnerabilities are, are usually ones uh, rooted in race and racism and class and classism. And um, look at COVID. You, you, you've named the factors, right? One, one factor that elevates the death rate is exposure to long-term um, fine particulate matter air pollution, which our communities have, right? Elevated exposure to air pollutants in EJ communities. And then the social factors. We've seen how race, um, you know, black and brown people and poor people have higher, higher um, death rates in COVID. So social factors coming into that. 
And, and who would have thought, I wouldn't have thought this, and listen, <laughs> Olivia will attest to this, um, you know, being black male is the most important fact about me in the United States. In spite of all the education I have, whatever else I do, the most important fact about me in the US is that I'm black. But even though, you know, I've kind of adapted to that, you have to to survive, it still surprised me that in the way race is so insidious in COVID, I would never have thought that because higher portions of our community had to physically go to work, you know, higher proportions of black and brown communities had to physically go to work, that that would make them more vulnerable to COVID. And again, a social factor. So, you know, it, it just points out that, that what we were saying about cumulative impact, it really makes our communities more vulnerable. And, you know, we've been pointing this out for a while. And we, we had Katrina, we had Flint, we had Sandy to some extent that showed this before. And after a while, you start to say, this ain't new. And you start to wonder if people care. Now, I think the combination of COVID and Black Lives Matter is really pushing us socially towards a, you know, paying more attention to these issues and making EJ and other, other you know, movements to deal with racial issues more relevant or at least get, have more focus on them. Thank you. Olivia, do you have anything you'd like to add? I really don't have much to add to that. That was an exceptional response. Um, I will piggyback right where Dr. Sheets left off um, in terms of how COVID has really illuminated disparities with, with us all being in this really vulnerable position. And I'm not an epidemiologist, but certainly we can see from the data that um, communities of color have been much more uh, impacted by this. Um, and I think that one of the things that led to the passage of this environmental justice legislation at this time um, it's been over a decade in the making. And I, I, our, is, there's some arguing about how long that's been. I know Dr. Sheets mentioned that, um, but it's been some time. And I just really think that um, being at the confluence of this public health emergency and the Black Lives Matter um, issues that have really um, come center stage. Certainly, um, as I know Nikki can attest, this is not new to us being aware of and sensitive to these issues and impacted by them. Um, but certainly for a national stage, it's really prominent right now. And I think that was a part of just the collective effort to know that when we know better, we have to do better and we need to have tangible examples of that. So I give um, tremendous kudos to our advocacy community and uh, to Senator Singleton and all of those who were um, sponsoring the bill and certainly to Governor Murphy who supported that legislation um, before it was passed by the legislature on Juneteenth. So that certainly speaks to uh, his commitment to communities of color. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, moving on to another question. I know both of you did both mention the definition of uh, overburdened community or EJ community rather um, in the legislation. And so there is a question, maybe we could talk a little bit about that definition. The question is, should an overburdened community be defined by the level of the burden? So if either one of you wanna address that and maybe talk about how the definition in the legislation came to be. So Nikki, I'll let you speak about how it came to be in the legislation because that process preceded me and I could talk about going forward how we're gonna be using that definition in the law and in the guidance. Okay. Um, yeah, what well, you, you heard, and, and I actually said that in my, in, in my, um, in my presentation that you really are talking about the definition for environmental justice community. And, and you know, the environmental justice advocacy community has defined EJ communities for a while as um, communities of color and low-income communities. Um, and, uh, you know, usually there's a correlation between race, income, the level of pollution in communities and vulnerability. You know, these communities are more vulnerable to things coming along because of classism and, and, and racism. So listen, in the legislation, the definition what, and what, it's, what these communities are called are really semantics. Um, and I'll be honest with you, <laughs> we, we didn't, and, and there were like three different definitions. 
And each of them, none of them um, originated with the EJ community. They came to us in three different iterations and we commented on each one and we fought to have the final definition as inclusive as possible. Um, and whether you call them overburdened or EJ communities, you know, it, 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 it may become confusing, but for the substance, it doesn't matter because the overburdened part is going to be in there when you do the EJ analysis, right? That's essentially what we're saying is that we've identified environmental justice communities, communities of color, low-income communities, and what the legislation does that has not generally been done with respect to that is put cutoffs in it. Because you, you like when I write stuff, I would say, oh, EJ communities, low-income communities and communities of color. Yeah, sheets. Well, what does that mean? You know, that's not good enough to really define an EJ community. The um, legislation does that with the 40% of color, 35% low income. So it's, you know, it, it has a very specific definition. So now we have EJ, you know, EJ communities. Now, when, when you do the permit analysis, the EJ analysis, you are essentially going to decide if that community is overburdened and whether the facility seeking the permit is gonna to add to that. So that part is gonna be introduced by the EJ analysis. We really should, I guess we can't do this now, but we should go back and say, we're defining over, you know, EJ communities, and then we're going to, you know, decide whether their the permit will cause a higher level of cumulative, you know, adverse. But that's all right. We were so happy to have this legislation, <laughs> and so happy that you know people were willing to address this. That we were we were not going to get into a fight over the over you know what the communities were called. Maybe we should have. I don't know. But we we were just like, let's go to the substance. So we 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 you know we we left that fight for another day. Great, thank you. Olivia? Yes, um, so just one thing to add from the uh, law perspective um, is that it has an or connector. And I think that's really important when uh, the overburdened communities were determined. Um, so it's that low income or minority or limited English proficient. So a community does not have to be all three or two of the three to be considered in this analysis. So I will say that I totally agree with uh, Nikki. I honestly thought that overburdened wasn't necessarily the best term for it, um, but again, it's totally semantics and that's what a rulemaking process is for. So that's something we can certainly uh, use a scalpel for in the rulemaking process for the law. When it comes to the guidance document uh, with the work we're gonna do across state agencies, um, we have an umbrella term within that document that we call communities of concern. So with that, what we're trying to do is create the space to expand the socioeconomic demographics that are used, because we know that for different departments and agencies, they have different cutoffs um, or different indicators that they use. So I'll take, for example, the Department of Transportation um, utilizes carless households as one of its key measurements. Um, the Department of Agriculture is going to use the number of students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, and it might not exactly um, fall within the same parameters as the overburdened communities. Now, of course, there will be tons of overlap. For the most part, it will overlap, but there might be some distinctions, and we're trying to ease everyone participating in this work. So uh, through that process, um, we have, we're creating a little bit more room for more socioeconomic indicators to be able to be a part of that conversation. And in the effort to identify environmental justice communities, we're going to consider uh, the, the presence of the stressors that will certainly complement what we're working on in the rulemaking process, but also the opportunity to look at the lack of environmental benefits and ways that departments and agencies can work to bring more benefits to um, our overburdened communities or the larger umbrella to communities of concern as a part of our analysis um, in doing action plans for the departments and agencies. So we're going to let it be a little broader so it's more relevant, more tangible, more organic uh, to get more departments easily involved in this work. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for sharing that comprehensive approach. Um, here's a question uh, that puts me on the hot seat, <laughs> but specifically for uh, Nikki, for Dr. Sheets. Have you found, you talked a little bit about um, the intentionality around asking 
the white led environmental groups to take a back seat um, and let not let I'm using the wrong language already. So let me start over <laughs> and to, um, to have the EJ groups continue to work in the forefront of the legislation rather than coming in with the larger organizations that sometimes the, the white led organizations can can bring in in an overbearing way and suck up all the oxygen in the room, if you will. And so the question is, have you found Enviro leaders, specifically white leaders who can listen um, to the EJ leads, the minority voices? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, obviously the best example is Clean Water Action, you know, which is a white led group, uh, Amy Goldsmith, and we have a, a great working relationship with them. And they recently came out and uh, opposed uh, the Transportation and Climate Initiative with us which we think is the first, well, um, Food and Water Watch. I, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Strike that, because I don't know if they've announced yet. <laughs> Although Matt Smith won't be mad at me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they, so Clean Water Action is, is the first environmental group that we know of to come out and, and oppose that. Now, EJ groups all over the Northeast are opposing. Um, so I'm not sure in other states, we haven't heard of it yet, if um, other environmental groups um, have come out uh, and oppose, oppose that. But look, it's a learning process. There are other environmental groups in the state that um, you know, we have some working relationship with, with. It's just not been as long as Clean Water Action, but there are other ones we, you know, we're, we're developing working relationship with that we respect a lot. And it's a learning process and there'll be errors on both sides. Um, but, you know, I, I think we've been talking about this for a while and, and, and people are, are, you know, hearing what we're saying and trying to work with this. And on a national level, we've been working with some big enviros for, for, um, for, for years now. Um, Earth Justice, um, Sierra Club, um, NRDC, Union of Concerned Scientists. And we are actually, some EJ groups are actually in kind of a formal initi initiative with them called the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform, of which NJEJA is heavily involved in and is, is based around that, around that principle. Now, you know, it won't be smooth sailing all the time, but we're gonna try. But in particular, the big issue that separated us and still separates us, so it's gonna be a challenge, is the market-based climate change mitigation systems. Because we're against carbon trading and other market-based systems, um, and environmental groups are for them. That has produced um, a, a challenge on the substantive policy. And then in other areas, even where we're together on it, again, there, there are challenges to, you, you said it, Jen, you said suck up the air, but even unintentionally, environmental groups, when they start working on issues, we would tend to get pushed aside. And then what happens is that people want to do EJ, will actually go to the environmental groups and not the EJ groups. And that's happened to us already. You know, that, that's not a theory. That, that is, has happened. And you have to be very intentional on both sides because almost all the time, this is not intentional, but it, it just happens because of the dynamics. And so, yes, a lot of people are listening. And so we think the future on that is bright, but, you know, but it's, it's also difficult. And, and, and it's difficult to ask someone to step back work with you, but step back and pass on some of the credit and pass on, you know, that's, and we realize that's a big ask and we really appreciate it when groups do that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, just being cognizant of the time, I'm gonna move on to a couple other questions. Um, and Deputy Commissioner Glenn, I think, uh, let's start with you on this one because I know that you um, ask, asked a question similar to this at one of the stakeholder meetings that you had recently, I think it was, um, the first one on the, the EJ rules last week, this week, I don't know, time is, is just a construct at this point. <laughs> um, and so how do we educate non EJ communities on the real problem and, and the real demands? And, and so we should have the, the question says we should have for, we should all have four solutions and impact that are for non-EJ areas. So let's just take the first part of the question and say, how do we educate non-EJ communities on EJ issues? Um, and, and I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. 
so to start with, within our department, we're really taking a look at uh, one of the offices that I oversee um, is the Office of Environmental Education. So we're really trying to take a look right now um, at priority ways that we can promote education about number one, what is environmental justice? And then two, what are the ways that we can mitigate it? And then to weave it into some of the curricula that we already do, um, like Project WET, Project Learning Tree, um, Project WILD, um, with existing programs we have already like Watershed Ambassadors uh, to just integrate it into some of those outreach initiatives that we already have. So those are some of the ways we're looking to do it now and I hope we have more things to roll out to everybody in 2021. Excellent, thank you. And then let's go back to Dr. Sheets. Um, I heard you speak at uh, some sessions last week, I believe it was, um, about an EJ index that I think um, is a little older at this point in time, but there is a question. Is there a utility to developing an EJ index for neighborhoods that would guide potential new residents about the risks of living there? I mean, that, that's a heavy question. Mm. Um, and I assume when you say index, you mean some kind of thing that would indicate what's the level of air pollution or what's the level of water pollution or maybe what's the level of um, environmentally related disease? Or, or yeah, something. the question doesn't specify, but I think that's a very yeah. fair assessment. Well, you know, I, I, I would say there's utility for EJ communities and non-EJ communities <laughs> for everybody to kind of have that information so you know what you're walking, what you're walking, uh, what you're walking into. And, um, I think that um, um, you know everybody needs that information. Um, I, I, I think um, for some folks, like look, look, to some extent, we have that information, right? And some groups are able to use that information and move away from areas that have a lot of pollution because they have the means to do that. And some groups can't, are not, even though they know there's a lot of pollution there, they, they still have to live there for either uh, economic or racial reasons. Because remember, you know, even if you have the money, not all communities, uh, Olivia and I still can't live in some communities that white folks can live in, or we have a harder time, we'll be steered away from them. And you know, that, that's still, and then when you add, you know, income to that, um, you know, that, that's, 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 a, that's a problem. And I got to tell you, I was naive. Um, I guess I am naive. I, I just want to say I'm idealistic. I, I'd rather say that. Um, when the screening tool was created under Governor Corzine, um, there was not time to attach a policy to that screening tool. And the screening tool is the graphs I showed you. And a more conservative administration came in, Governor Christie, and we scrambled to get that information <laughs> off the internet because we thought it might disappear. But to their credit, they kept it up there, the more conservative administration, but they didn't attach a policy to it. But I really thought that that graph, I've shown that graph all over the country I said, you know, once people see this graph, this is gonna be like, we're gonna have change, you know, because this goes against everything, as I said, we claim we stand for. And for many years, people would see the graph and say, oh, that's too bad. And that was it. So, you know, now I shouldn't complain too much because now we have the policies that we've been screaming for, but that did not cause immediate action. So more information is key. And that's what our municipal ordinance is, is the municipal ordinance is about in Newark, uh, gives more information, but you know, it has to be accompanied by other things like political power and political will and, uh, and, you know, and unselfishness, but yeah, let's give more information to folks. Great. Thank you. Um, so we've got two last questions and we'll do our best to, um, wrap up after that. Oh, there might be more, but let's, let's go with the next two. Um, and then we're getting close on time. So uh, Deputy Commissioner Glenn, let me ask you this one. Um, does the DEP have capable trained professionals to 
do the, the work that you spoke of this evening on um, environmental justice. This, the question specifically has to create environmental justice statements, but I think we're talking about the rules. And I know you already talked about the, the CCI and embedding DEP staff. And I certainly, as one who works closely with the DEP in a number of areas, know the DEP could always use more staff and a larger budget. Um, but how do you feel about capacity, I guess, at this point in time? DEP could always use more staff on a larger budget, uh, but I will tell you that we do have some very dedicated professionals who are within the department. So in terms of being able to advance this rulemaking process, yes, I, I think we're in really good shape. Um, one of the things that I think comes from uh, not having quite the, the number of staff that you would like is that those who are there spend a lot more time working together. So when you see uh, the people who are a part of our rulemaking team, we have representation from all around the department. So we have um, the, the, the co-facilitator of the rulemaking process with me is our chief legal advisor, uh, Sean Moriarty. And so he has uh, some of the lawyers that are within his team who are deeply involved in that process. Um, we also have one of our attorneys who's over on the green side of our department who's involved, and uh, we're hoping that her role in that is going to help us look at some of uh, the benefits uh, that can be um, factored in since the law does give um, some options for, for that. So we want to be really close to that side of the program and helping shape that. Um, we have people from the site remediation program, from land use regulation, uh, from air quality, and of course, our Office of Environmental Justice. So yes, we have representation from all across the department that's coming together to help advance this critical piece of legislation. That's fantastic, thank you. And so I'm gonna make this the last question of the evening um, just because we are running out of time. Uh, and I'll, I'll put it to um, both Deputy Commissioner Glenn and Dr. Sheets. Uh, air and land pollution are more visible. Um, as somebody who grew up in Philly, I, I know what the, the orange haze over the city looks like when you get a little perspective. Um, are there examples of water pollution in EJ communities that you could share? And what are the possible solutions? Go ahead, Olivia. I think that's, you probably better to shoot the answer that to you. Okay, yeah, I can speak to some of the work that's being done um, in our CCI communities and not just those, but also uh, when I think of water issues, the first thing that comes to mind for me from an environmental justice lens um, are the combined sewer overflows uh, that are in uh, just over two dozen uh, communities in our state. And so um, our efforts to try to get those systems separated in those municipalities, um, making sure that there's not polluted water that's going straight into major waterways, um, working with other landowners, um, some of them other state agencies like the Department of Transportation, who also has a number of outfalls that they own that go directly into waterways. Um, these are some of the efforts we're trying to advance from the water perspective. Um, we're also trying to do a lot of work um, in terms of water with lead as well. So those are two really big areas where um, we're doing a lot of work on that. And that's to give Nikki uh, two minutes to respond himself as well. Yeah, yeah I think the one, um, and we've not staked out um, large territory, and this is New Jersey EJ Alliance, but the, the one, frankly, that's a resource issue for us. We need to pay more attention to the one we worry about a lot about is lead mm -hmm. and a you know, huge water issue. We think, um, you know, and, and I keep kind of keep tabs of it. We work closely with Einbound Community Corporation in Newark and have interacted with, with them a lot and Eoshi from Rutgers. And we know that the water infrastructure in urban areas can be very old and can be, you know, uh, have a lot of lead pipes and, 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 and still be a problem. So we're going to have to do something about that, which is going to take a huge infrastructure in investment. Um, and, you know, we need more resources and people power and money to, to do that. And Jim, before you can, can we take a shot at the other question in the Q&A? Because I think it's an important question if we if we're do that shortly. Yeah, absolutely. If you're willing to stay, then uh, we can have the conversation. So the last question I see in the Q&A is um, separation of communities is what was historically the primary problem. Maybe re-blending 
not quite sure if we were ever blended. Uh, Re-blending could be a solution too. So um, yeah, Dr. Sheets, if you would please respond to that. Yeah, um, and, and I have to be careful about my language. And, 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 and the young Latina woman reminded me of this other day, I was on a panel with her. I, I, we talk a lot about communities of color. We do not mean to imply that the race of people in and of itself is a problem or makes you any less, or that it's bad to have black and brown communities. I, and and uh, it's, it's not the race of the people that's the problem, it's the racism, right? That's the problem. And I, for one, and, and, and you know, and, and, and I understand the language because we, we're kind of loose on that. So to me, and I think we have to be very careful about this, you know, and I grew up as a child, um, I know I'm older than either Jennifer or Olivia here, <laughs> but, you know, I grew up um, in a real era when the first integration was happening, especially in the colleges I went to, the first significant integration. So I would, could not have gone to Princeton or Harvard without, without uh, affirmative action. And that was the days when people were supporting a, affirmative, affirmative action. Right, um, but we have to be careful that we shouldn't have integration for integration's sake. I mean, I, I think working together and being together is important, but I think the goal is to have healthy communities, whether they're black, brown, Asian, is to make those communities healthy, right? And the problem is that the racism and other things travel with the race. Right, it's not the race itself. So if we can make black, we should be able to make black communities healthy and stay a black community if that's what the community wants and have good education if that's what the community wants and not have excessive air pollution. And I think it makes our nation stronger to have a mix of communities, some communities that are integrated, some communities that are not. And there should be healthy movement between all of those communities. But that's how you get a very rich culture. You know, you have American culture and part of that's African American culture, Asian American culture, Latino American culture, Italian American culture, Irish American culture. And I think all that is very healthy, but you shouldn't have to um, have to do away with black communities so you can have black people live in an area that doesn't have pollution in it. Right, we shouldn't have to move to an integrated white community before, before we can live in a pollution-free environment, right? And it all goes back to, I don't want a colorblind society. I want you to see me as black and treat me equal while you're seeing me as black. I want you to see woman as woman and treat woman equally while you're seeing them as woman. I'm sorry, this, this, <laughs> this No, I think it's a, an incredibly powerful point to, um, to have as part of our closing. Olivia, would you put an yes. explanation point or add to that? Yes, uh, what Nikki was just saying just resonated so deeply with me. Um, and I think it's just something for all of us to take, right? It's not that we should want to live in a world where we're colorblind. Being colorblind is not the solution. Just like any of us look at a painting, we look at flowers, we look at plants and we see the beauty that comes from the color. We see the beauty in biodiversity, right? We have to look at each other and our different colors and our cultures and see the beauty and value that we all bring. So color blindness isn't the answer. It's seeing each other for who we are and seeing the value added that everybody brings. Um, I think Nikki spoke very eloquently about the community piece. And I think that's a long-term vision for us. Um, what I wanted to add were just some of the things that are within our reach right now. And it's efforts to foster not just diversity, but to also foster inclusion and to look at our decision-making processes and knowing that we're talking to environmental commissioners this evening and some environmental groups and EJ advocates. Um, I think what we need to do as a lower hanging fruit, look at who we have in our decision-making processes. When you're reaching out to recruit new members of your environmental commission, make sure that you're looking for racial diversity, gender diversity, age diversity. That is so age diversity too, 
so that this next generation knows what it means to be civically engaged and they are prepared when the older generation is ready to retire, you can retire in peace. So that's important too. So that those decision-making processes and when we look at the boards, councils and commissions, not only that state government has, but also uh, those that run our nonprofit organizations, that representation is vitally important. Um, it enriches our decision-making, um, it fosters greater ownership and it results in better outcomes. So that's... That's all I have to say for this evening. Thank you. That's fantastic. That's that's a that's a lot to say, and I, I want to thank you most sincerely, uh, Dr. Sheets, Deputy Commissioner Glenn, for enriching us with this conversation tonight and bringing so much depth to what is um, an incredibly um, diverse, difficult, wide-ranging topic. And I, I hope that this is the first of many more that we get to participate in conversations either through DEP stakeholder groups or um, additional webinars from our, our collective nonprofits. Um, I wanna thank all of the commissioners who have been here with us this evening and um, wish you a, a good evening and um, be safe and healthy and invite you to again, join us tomorrow at noon for the closeout of our Environmental Congress, where we'll do some additional networking and celebrate our first ever virtual Environmental Congress coming to a close. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have Thank a good so evening. Much. Good night. Take care.